Uh, tonight we have Kevin McBride with us, who is a uh, associate professor of anthropology at UConn. He was for a while the state uh, archaeologist, and he um, was here with us uh, a few years ago, and he spoke about uh, the Pequot Wars, and he was not most, uh, I don't think in his speech he ventured into knowing, but he was right at the top of Fort Hill, so he was pretty darn close and kind of along 215 and um, uh, he was had been tracing the the uh, path of the war uh, and and that but tonight i think we're going to actually go down into knowing and uh, so we're excited to have him here and to hear about uh robin cassison so thank you very much for coming <sighs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, when I got the invitation to speak, I was pleased, but a little surprised. Um, I've really never given a talk on an individual before. It's usually, you know, archaeology, battlefield archaeology. But um, Casa Cinnamon has long been of great interest to me. Um, many years ago, I actually wrote an article on him. Um, I wouldn't read it just because a lot of it was, you know, wrong. I think we think of, him, um, we think of things a little differently now. But it, he's probably one of the most important native leaders of the 17th century. And I don't say that in the context of, you know, he contributed to broad sweeping patterns politically, socially, economically. But what he achieved was really remarkable. I mean, the Pequots were declared extinct in 1638. Um, they weren't allowed to live in their homeland again. They were never to be called Pequot again. And his leadership and his ability to work with colonial leaders um, particularly John Winthrop Jr., and there's an interesting story there, which we'll talk about. Um, he mm -hmm. managed to gain a degree of politi uh, political autonomy for the Pequots, expand their land base over the decades of 3,000 acres. Um, and he became an important figure uh, politically on, on, a large, on the larger scene. But he did it by, make, uh, by developing personal relationships, diplomacy, understanding the complexities of that political landscape. And I have to say, I've known you know, two Pequot leaders pretty well, Skip Hayward and Rodney Butler. And I, you know, I'm not exaggerating this at all. They operate the same way. They, you know, their, their style of negotiating different landscape very, very similar. Um, we're also going to talk about this painting. Um, it's uh, one of the more interesting um, pieces of artwork in New England, long purported to be Ninigrit. Um, I do not think that. I think it's Casa Cinnamon. And I am pleased, when I looked at the RISD website tonight, where this is housed, they have changed their um, uh, moniker. This is now, they now call this Robin Cassis Cinnamon, so. We'll see. I'll give you my argument. So, next. All right, so what do we know about Robin Cassis Cinnamon? Um, you know, you all have some idea. You have, you, you were familiar with, with him, with his association here. Um, and here, you know, the master ticket, the future Mashantucket people uh, were here in 1651. They uh, retained a uh, reservation of lands here until about 1712. But um, this is an interesting map for a number of reasons. So you are familiar with the Pequot War, and you're probably familiar that Massachusetts Bay and Connecticut were arguing over um, you know, which lands they could claim, Pequot lands they could claim by right of conquest. So one of the issues they were engaged in for 30 years after the war were boundaries. Uh, 
Where was the boundary? Where was Concord Peak? Where was Pequot land and therefore where was Concord Pequot land? So this 1662 map um, is part of that discussion, part of that controversy where Connecticut is bringing in native leaders to testify as to where Pequot boundaries were. So the map is interesting for a couple of reasons. One, it's either native drawn or native inspired. That's clearly a native uh, map, which they're rare. Um, but it also, there's three signatories on that map. There's Uncas, there's Casa Cinnamon, and then there's Ninigrit. Um, What's interesting is, as part of Cassa Cinnamon's testimony, that yes, Pequot land did extend as far east as Weekapog, Rhode Island. So, you know, southwestern Rhode Island was Pequot territory um, until it was taken back um, in a war, one of the wars of the Narragansetts, um, about 1633 34. And at that point, you know, Narragansett's claimed that area by right of conquest. And as you're probably aware, Narragansett and Pequot were in a constant state of, of warfare. <clears throat> but what's interesting is, uh, uh, at testifies essentially, I know what I'm talking about. I used to hunt here on behalf of the Sachem when I was a boy. Uh, we used to drive deer onto the peninsula. So that brief statement is loaded with information. One, it confirms that it was Pequot territory, but it also confirms this is where Cassisonin was probably from. And there's other circumstantial evidence that suggests that as, suggests that as well. Um, some of the uh, uh, other native men leaders that he referred to as his cousin had a strong Eastern Pequot um, association. Weequash in particular, who is an important figure, which we'll talk about. Um, Eastern Pe uh, he was Pequot, but he married an Eastern Pequot woman. So there's a lot of circumstantial evidence to suggest that Robin was from here. Now, what does that mean as a boy? Um, you know, it's hard to determine uh, when he was born. We know he died in 1692. And I figured since Uncas lived till he was 80, you know, Cassius Cinnamon probably lived till he was 75 or 82. So I, you do a little math and you come up with that 1612. So this would suggest in the 1620s, perhaps, is a boy, he's, he's living here. So there were Pequot villages here um, prior to the Pequot War and prior to when the Narragansetts... Like, um, like you're viewing... He, I'm sorry, yeah, no, no, no. Uh, I'm sorry, South Weekapog, southwest of Rhode Island. This was clearly Pequot territory where we are now. Um, so just to give context of the Pequot War, so this is kind of where this story starts. So the Pequots had, we know, 26 villages, and there would be a sachem for each village. Some of the villages were small. In fact, we, were ex we, were, we are excavating one now in, um, in Pequot Woods that was attacked it's, during the Pequot War, and it, it contains six houses, six households. Um, that would be a small village of maybe 50 to 60 people. And then that would be on the smaller side, and at the larger side would be the fortified villages at Fort Hill or Mystic, where you might be, it might be 300 or so people. And we estimate the population was about 4,000. That's down quite a bit after the smallpox epidemics of 1633-34. Um, and depending on the size of your village, depending upon uh, your, your lineage, you know, that sort of uh, influenced the status um, you had. One thing that we found recently that was very interesting is, you know, how was it that, that Casa Cinnamon and the communities we identify associated with him at Menamiog, New London in 1637, survived the war. Um, the English were systematically hunting down um, anyone who was involved in the war, executing leaders, um, capturing and enslaving, you know, native uh, Pequot communities all over. Casa Cinnamon in his community seemed to have largely escaped. And the reason apparently is, 
that this uh, leader, Weequash, who was one of two banished Pequots who guided, living within Narragansett's East Niantics, who guided John Mason's to the Pequot Fort. He was an important part of that attack, an important part of the success. He is related to Cassus Cinnamon, and the document we found basically says that Weequash warned Cassus Cinnamon um, before the war. It must have been really just before the attack on, on Mystic, or, or when war was declared. Stay out of it. Don't get involved. It's not going to be. It's not going to serve you well. And that strategy, we don't know how he did it, seems to have worked. So his communities are largely, largely intact, and we see them in, uh, in Namiag in 1637. Next. Um, so this is the, these are the Namiag communities and one at Noank. Um, this is a really interesting document. So there's a letter from Roger Williams to John Winthrop in, um, I think, May... Uh, of 1638 that identifies not only the Pequot communities at Namiog, and we know Ro Cassius Cinnamon came from one of these communities. I suspect uh, the one at the bottom, the Puppenog. Um, it identifies a number of houses. It identifies the location, obviously. Um, we're looking at 73 houses. It it's always a little difficult to estimate population um, from the archaeological record or ethnohistoric record. Usually when population figures are mentioned by Europeans, they're, they're fighting men. But there is a ratio of about, you know, which we use about one to four or so, and we'll talk about, talk about that next. But you know, these uh, communities of various sizes are strung out. The northern one, Tapapanog, was probably about where Khan College and um, the Coast Guard Academy is now. And then they're sort of strung along the Thames River. We don't, we don't know where. Um, down into New London proper, it, w it would seem. They would have been spaced far enough apart that they would not have impinged upon each other's planting fields and things like that. We make certain assumptions like that. Um, so the reason, uh, and we'll talk about it in a minute, the reason these communities were being um, enumerated was in the six months, eight months after the Pequot War, um, the surviving Pequots, most have been enslaved or captured, um, were kind of all over the place. They were, English were fearful of them um, you know, reuniting. They were fearful of them reforming the tribe. Um, the entire strategy of the English during the Pequot War was to basically eliminate the Pequot as a viable social, political, and certainly military entity. Treaty of Hartford was designed to do that, um, but they first needed to know where these communities were. So this is why this information comes to us. Next slide. This is the Treaty of Hartford, and these are the, you know, the, um, and this was an agreement treaty between Connecticut, the Narr Narragansett, and Mohegan. Um, it's a fairly complicated document. We're not going to go into sort of the other aspects of it. But for our purposes, and respect to Robin, um, the, the main points are, you know, the Pequots are to, the remaining surviving Pequots are to be divided, to be divided among the Mohegan and Narragansett, the allies of the English during the Pequot War. Um, and they are never to be called Pequot again but Mohegan and Narragansett. Um, the other major point here is they will no longer suffer to live in their land. It is the English land by right of conquest. They're not allowed back in their homeland. So they're basically being extinguished um, as a people, Pequot, 
um, and, and landless. The group at uh, Namiog was placed under um, Uncas's authority. And that created some problems too. Next slide. All right, so this is just a list. I wish I, I was trying to find the original document, but um, it's too hard. it was too hard for me. But this is a list of males at Namiog, and there was another community at Niantic Bay. Um, and when you look at this, there's you know, a total of um, 62 males. Now, generally, as I mentioned before, so we're trying to maybe get a sense of the entire Pequot population at Niantic and Namiog. We would just multiply that figure of one male times four to five dependents, you know, children, uh, women, et cetera. Um, but it doesn't work here because there was a really high attrition rate among Pequot males because of the war. Uh, the English systematically hunted down and executed any Pequot males who were involved in the war, fought against the English, killed the English. They were also trying to locate and execute any of the Pequot sachems. Um, and that strategy was to, to keep the Pequots, you know, from reforming militarily and, and politically. Robin escaped that, obviously. So that's an interesting and important document. So that is the number of Pequots we are probably dealing with at Namiag and Antic. And that, you know, as we can have the opportunity to estimate the population of Mastega Pequot over the next several decades, that figure kind of stays. It looks like about 500. Next one. Um, these are artifacts from that Tapapanog village site that I think is related to Robin. You know, the locative vending there, Quag, is probably, it's Quahog shell. This is probably refers to Mamacoke Island, where there's these massive shell middens, um, and that's where Connecticut College is. But there was a metal detectorist uh, who had been detecting here, and he called me up, and he said, hey, I found some things that you might be interested. Um, and one is a mattock, you know, there's an arrow point. There's some brass scrap and some other things. Um, and he agreed not to do that anymore. That's probably the biggest problem we're facing right now is detectorists going out and just, you know, um, devastating historic period sites that have metals in them. Um, but that's interesting. This may well have been, and I don't have much evidence to suggest that, I think this may well have been Cassa Cinnamon's community because it's the largest. That's all I got. Where is it? Um, it's where um, uh, Connecticut College and the Coast Guard Academy is. Yeah, probably along the river. Um, and these objects are typical of early 17th century native sites. They're like a signature, particularly Maddox and brass scrap from cutting up kettles. Next slide. Um, when Back in the 80s, Harold Julie of Connecticut College um, was kind of monitoring the construction of a Con College soccer field. Um, and he they uncovered a burial. And he excavated, uh, they studied it, radiocarbon dated it, et cetera, et cetera. And it would appear that this is a cemetery associated with that community. It sort of established, you know, when you look at the, the historical record, uh, the northernmost community, when you look at the artifacts, the detectors uh, recovered, and when you look at where this was, it's all part of the, it. It's the, all suggested is that there's a community of Pequot there in the early 17th century. What was interesting about this individual, he's an adult male, about 45, um, he had evidence of tuberculosis. Now that's not an uncommon um, disease. Uh, there is tuberculosis that was in the New World prior to the arrival of Europeans, but there's a new strain introduced that had, you know, had a devastating impact on Native people. Usually think in terms of smallpox epidemics, but tuberculosis was 
um, probably far more devastating. There was a native cemetery in, in South Kingston, Rhode Island, dated in the 1660s. Of the 50 burials, 30% exhibited lesions on their ribs, which suggests you know, severe tuberculosis. So if 30% of that population had tuberculosis, all of them had it in one form or another. And as I said, this is, you know, a very insidious disease because it can, you know, you can have it for many, many, many years and it weakens you. It makes you more susceptible to other diseases, but it's devastating. And this one individual suggests um, that, you know, the population may be struggling in this. And this is pretty early. I mean, this is 1630s, maybe early 1640s. And, you know, there's, you know, a lot of tooth wear, which is not uncommon with, with people with heavy diet of, of maize because of, the, of grinding and, and stone uh, mortars and using pestles, et cetera, et cetera. Next slide. Um, so one of the most important parts of this story, and the, the, the f most important uh, factor in the eventual success and survival of the Pequots was Cassa Cinnamon's uh, relationship with John Withrop Jr. So how did this come about? It's a little complicated, but, and I'll make it short. Um, in the battle, uh, it, during the Pequot War, there was a Pequot woman, the wife of a sachem, we don't know her name. We know her husband was Mononatu, one of the most prominent and important Pequot sachems. Um, in 16, in um, April of 1637, the Pequots raided Wethersfield. One of the most significant uh, events of the Pequot War, because up to that point, seven months into the war, the Pequots did not attack any English settlements. They did attack Fort Saybrook. They did attack, you know, traders and settlers there. They stayed away from um, the settlements because, you know, there is, uh, in, in indigenous warfare, uh, at least as we can gather in the 17th century, there were social controls about attacking women and children. And during a conversation that took place between the Pequots and Lion Gardner, with John Stanton was there, who I think made the worst interpretation of that dialogue. I think he's largely responsible for, you know, um, if not starting the Pequot War, sort of, you know, moving it forward. But anyway, that's a long story. Pequots decide to attack Weatherfield. And the first time in the war, they killed women and children. That is why Connecticut declared war on the Pequots two weeks later, for that very reason. Prior to that, they did not feel they had the grounds to declare war. But two girls, the Swain girls, were captured during that raid and brought back to Pequot territory, where they were, you know, paraded around, you know, all the villages. Well, apparently, there was a Pequot the wife of the Pequot Sachin, Mononato's wife, who protected and cared for those girls. They were, you know, two, a couple of, few weeks later, they were, re, they were ransomed, released from, with Dutch help. But that woman, um, as the Pequots, following the Battle of Mystic Fort, the Pequots are fleeing their territory, they're, mo they're fleeing down the Connecticut coast, English catch up with them at Fairfield, the Fairfield Swamp Fight, the last major battle of the Pequot War. She is captured. And there is a letter, and Winthrop Sr., now the governor of Massachusetts Bay, heard about it, knew about it, knew about her. And he gave instructions to the soldiers to do not harm her. Um, you bring her to me. I am going to protect her for, and her children for the, the kindness and service she did to those two English girls. So that woman is in the Pequot, is in the Winthrop household. So a, a little more context. Um, with the defeat of the Pequots, 
you know, there was a political vacuum in New England. You know, the Pequots were, ex were extremely powerful. Um, and all, you know, many of the remaining, many of the stations from other tribes are attempting to fill that, vac that power vacuum. And they were doing it by building a population base which includes women and which includes fighting men. They are doing it by marrying the widows, daughters, uh, mothers, sisters of Pequot sachems who had been executed or killed during the war. Uncas marries 12 women, Pequot women. It's very clear from all of this that women are uh, a really important source of power. Um, and influence and community, which of course English don't talk about it because you know they're a patrilineal, patrilocal society. You know, power resides in male. They just don't talk about women. But this is really clear. Everybody is doing this: Ninigrit, Miantanami, Uncas, Wequash. List goes on. They're all seeking out these Pequot uh, women of standing, of high status, through marriage. They have claim to their communities. They have claim to um, potential lands, etc. So Uncas wants the widow of this Sachem uh, Mononato who is in the Winthrop household. He sends Cassus Cinnamon. This is the first time we hear of Cassus Cinnamon. This is in 1637. Uh, spring of 1637. He sends Cassus Cinnamon with nine other uh, Mohegan men to the Winthrop household to either buy or steal her. Um, that's Cassus Cinnamon's introduction to the Winthrop household. He apparently was successful because that women en a woman ends up back here. We, we hear about her about a year later. And he is given, at some point, this 10 fathoms of wampum that Uncas had offered. But he also stays in the Winthrop household. We don't know for how long. And during that stay, he became a um, servant to Adam Winthrop, um, the youngest Winthrop. Um, he would have been a young, young teen or, you know, maybe, or, or 12 or so. so. How long he's in that household, we don't know. We do know he's back in Namiog in 1645, and I suspect he wasn't at the Winthrop household, you know, for that entire time. But he clearly became known to and became familiar with and was friends with the Winthrop family. And John Winthrop Jr., um, next slide, when he is deciding where he wants to put his new plantation um, in Concord Pequot territory. He leaves Boston in November of 1645. He goes right to Casa Cinnamon, who is at Namiog. And actually, at this point, he meets up with him in the Pequonic area, right around here. And Casa Cinnamon then proceeds to give him a tour of Pequot territory. So that, and, and introducing him to other native leaders in the area. Um, so clearly by this time, you know, Kasten is probably fairly influential. He certainly is with Winthrop, but he also has standing, beginning to have standing with the other native leaders in, in these communities. But that was instrumental in, next slide, in why Winthrop Jr. chose Namiog for his plantation. Number one, you know, Winthrop was, a, uh, was an alchemist. He was very knowledgeable about mineralogy. He, he had recently purchased a uh, graphite mine in, in Stockbridge, St I'm sorry, Sturbridge area. He saw um, the Thames River at that time called the Pequot River as a deep water port from which to extract and ship, you know, ores and minerals out for profit making. John Winthrop was, you know, all about, he was a businessman. 
So number one, New London is that deep water port, but one of the most important reasons he selected Namiag as his, for his plantation was the presence of the Pequots. Um, he basically, you know, one reason is, well, we might be able to use them for labor. Um, no evidence that that ever happened. But he, like many other colonial leaders, were really concerned about Uncas's ambitions. And he felt it would be important to have a friendly native presence at Namiog with the English to sort of keep an eye on things. Um, that pattern of embracing um, native leaders for not only for guides but for information started with the Pequot War. Mason was all over that. I mean, he highly valued his, his spies, interpreters, people who were gathering information from him. And as a result of the Pequot War, they valued native allies against other native enemy. So he saw in the Pequots a future, you know, uh, ally should, you know, should it come, come to that. And they did. They remained staunch allies of the English through King Philip's War and beyond. Next slide. So these are various versions of Casta Cinnamon signatures. Um, don't know why they change. They, they do. Um, we do know natives change names as if, you know, associated with certain important events. He didn't change his name, but I always wondered if the signature. Um, there is a bit of a commonality to them. It's, you know, if you look at the coiled snake, which is pretty unique, uh, it's got to have some meaning. Um, the other ones are sort of have that sort of twisty, sinuous. Um, but these signatures are on documents. Um, one of them is on a document. Um, Cassius Cinnamon is a witness to a land transfer in the Hudson River. Um, the snake is, is, he's a witness and described as the governor and chief counselor of the Pequot, so he's already has standing at this point um, for that purchase of that lead, uh, the graphite mine. The bottom signature is a signature in, you know, on the Mixcotta map that we talked about earlier, 1662. So these, you know, Winthrop is using him as sort of credibility. You know, he has standing, he's a Pequot sachem. Clearly, he's signing with people like Uncas and Miantanami and other native leaders. He is recognized by them as a peer. Um, he has standing in the native community, he has standing in the English community, he certainly has standing in the Pequot community. Which, by the way, um, it, it's very clear from other sources, et cetera, that um, you can't just assume leadership in a Pequot community or, or village. You have to be from the, an appropriate lineage and family. Um, so there is a degree of status differentiation, differentiation based on lineage and family association. Um, and he was clearly, you know, um, of, that, of that standing. Next slide. So one thing he's also involved with, and this might be the dark side of Castle Cinnamon, um, there have been several conspiracies over the decades uh, whereby various native leaders are trying to, um, you know, gather other native leaders and people in a conspiracy to defeat the English. You know, the Pequots tried to do that on the eve of the Pequot War, the Narragansetts, and they're always using the same arguments. If we don't do this, our way of life is over, they're going to do us in, you know, we're all going to disappear. Uh, 1643, the Narragansett Sachem Miantanami uh, was, was trying the same thing. Um, you're familiar with King Philip's War, 1676. Philip had the same arguments. Um, so this is interesting. And it really looks like Cassius Cinnamon is involved, or at least considering things. You know, he sends his deputy uh, subsachem Daniel to New York to discuss things with the Mohawk. You know, um, they, they report this dance. Um, 
and that would be a gathering of you know native leaders and people it's not kind of you know a powwow type situation it's more of a ritual ceremony a political event um, but you know um, it's his, this dance is discovered here he this occurred in Noank um, where at that gathering was Uncas and Ninigrit. And Mason had a comment like, are you kidding me? Uncas and Ninigrit haven't, have looked, they've only looked at each other over the muzzle, a, a, a barrel of a, of a musket for 30 years. What are they doing together here? Something's up. Stanton sort of echoed that as well. And there was a really um, interesting, um, uh, and remember what I'm about to say about Ninigrit. Connecticut colonists and Winthrop, they did not like Ninigrit. Ninigrit was not a good guy, uh, at least from an English perspective. He always caused trouble. He was always like seeking, um, you know, the, to benefit. He was always doing intrigue and things of that nature. So, you know, um, Stanton goes to seize Ninigrit for being belligerent. And they're about to fight. You know, the, Narraga the, Ninig the Eastern Antics who are there with Ninigrit and the militia with Stanton are there. They're, they're going to fight. Cass Cinnamon steps in. He goes, just hold on, right? Um, I will offer you wampum. Let's just calm this down. And he basically says, it's a lot easier to, to replace wampum than replace lives. It's just one of those statements like, yeah, that make, you know, makes perfect sense, right? Diffuses the situation. But I think that also test, testifies to his influence with not only the native communities, but the English as well. He has standing. What was really going on at this time is, un, is a little unclear. Um, but something was clearly going on, and I think that, you know, the English discovered it, they kind of nipped it in the bud, and it didn't go too far, but, you know, Casa Cinnamon and Uncas were clearly considering some options here. And I just, just at the bottom there, you'll see a list, you probably can't see it in the back. It's a list of, um, right after that dance, the English are going around confiscating all the Pequot firearms. Um, and this is a list of some men with their firearms. And as a battlefield archaeologist, uh, military historian, I find it really interesting, A, how well armed they are, um, and the range of weapons from, you know, muskets, rapiers, pistols, swords, you know, powder horns, et cetera, et cetera. So that's sort of an interesting it's in document and it's sort of a, you know, a byproduct of, of what occurred next. All right, this is just to give you a sense of, you know, I talked about that land base expanding and Winthrop really um, angered Mason and the Connecticut colony by his support of the Pequots. And at this time, um, while at Namiog, um, you know, the Namiag Pequots, uh, when, the, when the English began to arrive there in 1646 in the winter, um, cast in the Namiag Pequots, put them up, housed them, fed them, protected as best they can. But things developed and went badly with Uncas and the Pequots, and it sort of spilled over into the English. So Winthrop just sees this as another Uncas problem. Um, and he also realizes that it's in his and the Pequot's best interest to get out of Mohegan control and resettle them away from um, Uncas in their own territory again. That's only what, uh, you know, this, this happens 12 years after the Treaty of Hartford, you know, completely against what the tenants of the Treaty of Hartford said. They're Pequot again, they're autonomous, semi, and they're in their territory again. Um, and because Unthris, Un I mean, because Winthrop saw the value and importance, and a lot of this was underscored by his personal relationship with Casa Cinnamon, who he trusted completely, um, their land base went virtually from zero, 
to 3,000 acres by 1675, 76. Um, a lot of that had to do with keeping the Pequots happy, just in case they were ever needed in a major war, which happened in 1675, 76, with um, you know, King Philip and all the other tribes in New England, of which the Pequots and Mohegans were really important factors in the eventual victory uh, of, of the English. But this just shows you, yes, they are getting bounced around a bit. You know, they're in Noank in 1651. By 1712, they're forced to vacate, except for seasonal access for fishing, fowling, and clamming. Um, and that's because of the expanding, you know, English population. And they're given a brief, you know, piece of land at the head of the Mystic River in 1660, um, 1665, and then eventually Mashantucket in 1666, and also Walnut Hill, which is sort of, you know, off to the side there too. Um, so, yes, there's movement. Pequots, as a conquered people, could never have the status of owned lands like the Pequots do today, Indian country, federal lands. Um, these were common lands they were given until the English needed them. Um, next slide. And this is just, you know, a little, a little glimpse of the cultural landscape here. Um, you know, we have a couple of cemeteries, one in near B.B. Cove that's 17th century, probably associated with the Namag Pequots. There's also one at Mason's Island, you may recall, you know, a decade or so ago, um, uh, construction workers digging a house foundation, discovered a Pequot cemetery dated 1650 or so. Um, that is the time that the Pequots were at Namiog. I do not think that cemetery is, I'm sorry, they were at Noank. I do not think that cemetery was associated with the people at, um, at uh, uh, Noank. Shortly around late 1640s, early 50s, Castanum complains to the Connecticut court that his, some of his people are leaving him to the east side of the Mystic River. That group eventually became part of the Eastern Pequot under a sachem called Mamaho. So that's an interesting story in and of itself. You know, they're on Mason's Island. When Mason owned it, there's a cemetery there. And Mason's letting this happen. Um, and it's a pattern we see. It's, the, it's often very beneficial for English uh, farmers, herdsmen, to have you know, landless native communities live on their property because they help clear it, they take half their produce. Uh, we see this in the minor farm. Uh, we're probably seeing it at Mason's Island as well, but it's, it's interesting. Uh, one site I want you to look at is that late 17th century domestic site over there at Haley Farm. Uh, that's something we found I don't know, about five or six years ago when we were doing our battlefield surveys at Bluff Point and elsewhere. Um, next slide. So this is some of the, yes? Could you just, I saw uh, for Wine Shocks and then Robbins. Ford. Sure, go back. Yeah, I meant, thanks. I meant to talk about that. So Fort Hill, where you, you know the location, it's at the, it's the top of um, Noank Road, uh, where the water tower is, um, is where uh, one of two fortified Pequot fortified villages were at the time of the Pequot War. It was called Weinshanks, and it was um, uh, Sassicus, the chief sage in the Pequot, resided there. Where the water tower is. Yeah, you know, we, you know, through metal detecting, we find evidence of that fort, and it's early. We found, I think, a Spanish coin from the mid 1500s. So it's just early. It's always tough dating native sites, but um, but at the corner, the intersection there of Route One and um, Noank Road, there is a red house. Um, right at that intersection, um, we've ha we found a number of deeds that reference. Um, that sort of intersection and the, to, the, to the corner of the old Indian fort. Uh, 
that's not that's not wine shops and that area is referred to as robin's fort hill um in many in many records and i think what we're looking at is a second fort um, all native communities had forts they weren't to protect against English attack, they were to protect against native attack. Um, in the case of the, um, um, the Pequots here, they not only had a fort at you know, Fort Hill, but also Mashantucket as well. And probably there were other forts uh, around. So that's you know, what, the, what explains those, those two. We've done some work in that area. We did find you know, evidence of 17th century native artifacts. Didn't find evidence of a palisade or anything like that, but we didn't do that much work. But historical records and the archaeological records suggest that's the location of, of Robin's Fort. Did anyone live inside the walls? Don't know. Um, but it may certainly, at the very least, it would have been a place of refuge should they be attacked. And it's in a very prominent location and indefensible. Is not the water tower right near that intersection? The water tower is north of it. That's where Wine Shacks was. Robbins Ford is a little bit south of there, at the in, at, right at the intersection. So the, the water tower is north of the cemetery, if you're familiar with this. Uh, it, it's right at the water tower. And that's about a quarter mile north of the intersection. And I th that's where we find another cluster of artifacts. And the deeds say that it's, you know, there was an old fort there. Next slide. Um, so these are some of those artifacts from that site. So this dates to the late 1600s, based upon diagnostic artifacts, that spoon handle, uh, for one. And this is probably, um, it's a Pequot site. Um, and it's undoubtedly associated with the Noank uh, Pequots. But what it says is, is it says something interesting. If you look at you know, where the cemetery was at BB Cove, if you look at where Noank proper is, where the Pequots probably had most of their population, um, and you look at this site, you look at Robbins Fort Hill, they're not just confined to Noank specifically. It's a broader landscape that they are working within. Um, which I think is interesting. So what precisely are they doing at Haley Farm? Don't know. There is a shell bin there. There's food remains there. Um, it's clearly, it's not a large occupation, but it's substantial. Um, it just adds to sort of the, the mystery, or, or, or not a mystery so much as there's a lot we don't know. Um, but I think we do realize in the 17th century, the, the, the Pequots are not necessarily confined to very specific locations. Their main community might have been here, but maybe they're moving around seasonally, certainly the fort's being used, et cetera. Um, and those are very typical objects you'd find um, in any 17th, native 17th century state. Thimbles are really common. Um, Native and colonial soldiers are bringing them into battle with them. They all, they, have, they all have thimbles and they all have jaw harps, if you know what a jaw harp is. We have found more, more jaw harps on the battlefields than almost any other artifact. Um, you know, it's, a, um, uh, it's sort of a horseshoe-shaped device with a thin piece of iron. And you put it up against your teeth and you kind of twang it. If you want to really know what they sound like, uh, played by professionals, Latvian folk music uses them a lot. You just Google or go to YouTube and go Latvian jaw harp, jaw harp concert. It's pretty wild. Yeah. What is the symbol used for? You know, most of, you know, obviously sewing things, you know, buttons, um, tears. I think the reason, one of the reasons that they're often bringing them into battle with them is sewing up wounds. Uh, um, and that's native men and, you know, we, have, we've, we had a couple of contacts in the Pequot War battlefields where we found a couple of encampments, a native encampment where we could literally see what native men were bringing into battle with them because they were falling out of their pockets, thimbles, uh, needle. Um, 
jar, um, and other things too. So I think it's, it's, it's a common part of their kit, uh, these thimbles. Next slide. All right, so now we're moving on to the, to the painting, okay? Um, there has long been a controversy about whether, well, the con there's no controversy. Uh, that painting, which is the earliest oil painting of a native person identified in New England, I would venture to say maybe the even East Coast, um, it's reasonably well done. It's not a Dutch master, but it's reasonably well done. Um, it, has, it had long been assumed that it was Ninigrit. I believe it's Casa Cinnamon. There is no proof to support either position. Um, although I think my circumstantial evidence is much stronger. Because okay. it was commissioned by John Winthrop Jr., number <coughs> one. He's not going to commission a painting of Ninigrit, who they were enemies. Um, we know his relationship with Cassis Cinnamon. But um, this painting came out of the Winthrop household uh, in Boston many decades ago. Um, and I'm a little murky, but it was sold at auction in New York. And it was purchased by an individual who eventually gave it to the uh, Rhode Island School of Design. So because it was located in Rhode Island, all the curators assumed it was Ninigrit. They also assumed that it could not have been painted in the 17th century. Um, there was no one good enough in the colonies to paint it. Therefore, it had to be 18th century, making it Ninigrit II, Ninigrit's son. Um, and that's where it, it stood. And, you know, probably about 15 years ago, um, I began to feel pretty strongly for the reason, some of the reasons I just said, this is not Ninigrit. It's, it's Casa Cinnamon. I mean, these were not cheap. This, would be, this could have been 500 or 1,000 pounds to pay somebody to paint this in the 17th century. Um, next, oh, and by the way, on one thing most people don't realize is uh, on his left leg, there is a tattoo. Um, and it's kind of faint. It's really, you, you really can't tell what it is. To me, it looks like a thunderbird, but you know, somebody else can look at it and you know, say it's, it's, it's something else. But it is, a, it is definitely a tattoo. Um, there's other interesting uh, aspects about this. Um, the clothing completely fits, whether it be 17th or early 18th century. Um, the red cloth and the cloth that's draping over his arm, those, they look to be trade cloth, duffel cloth, woolen cloth. His headband is wampum. We, we see those often, uh, black and white wampum. <coughs> he has a necklace. We see those. Um, and that's made of wampum and shell um, as well. He has a baton, um, which we found a couple of uh, sources that basically s the English are giving native leaders these batons as a sign of their rank, status, and leadership. So it doesn't necessarily mean it's Casa Cinnamon because he has a baton, but I think it suggests he's a native leader, um, <coughs> recognized certainly by the English. <coughs> Next slide. Was <coughs> Was Ninigrit Narragansett? Eastern Niantic. Eastern Niantic. Would the dress be similar for both tribes? Yeah, yeah, I don't think you'd be able to tell. There might be something subtle that you and I would never notice. <coughs> um, I bring these up as other examples of <coughs> depictions of Native people. The image <coughs> to the right of Casa Cinnamon. That is a figure that might help, thanks. 
that was found at the Mystic Fort, Fort um, uh, the Mystic Fort. And if you look at it, it's made of steatite or soapstone, which is a very traditional native medium. They make bowls and pipes out of it. And if you look at that stance carefully, and if you can, thank you, detect the detail, he also is, is, has a blanket that draped over his arm. And the stance is this sort of, you know, I get, the, I get the same sense from both poses of, of, you know, leader, leadership. But that steatite figure is remarkable for its detail. I've never seen anything like that anywhere. His hair, he's wearing a sash, he's got a blanket draped around in his arm, much like Casa Cinnamon. And the only other image we have of a native person in, in, in the general area is, is it's an it's a, um, engraving of an individual on the right. He is a Delaware Indian who was captured during Keefe's War in 1643-44 in the Lower Hudson. Uh, the Governor Keefe gave him to two Dutch soldiers um, I think it's part payment for something, who brought him back to Amsterdam. And their intent was to make money off of him um, by basically bringing him into bars and taverns and, you know, you pay a fee, you can go see him. But not that simple. The Dutch were very particular about how such people are treated. Um, these soldiers had to make a contract with him and the agreement was, yes, you will be allowed to, you know, display Jacques, they call him. But you need to educate him, you need to feed him, you need to clothe him, you need to take really good care of him. So that engraving was probably made about eight to ten years after Jacques was brought to Amsterdam. Um, so he's obviously been around for a while, but his, his, necklace, his headband are spot on. I mean, we actually find those things in burial sites, you know, um, in, in the area. So it's, it's quite realistic. Uh, it's tattoos or just, you know, we see those described as well. It's a really interesting um, set of, of, uh, of imagery. Next slide. All right, so I so see we sort of went over these, these arguments. Um, so you know, is the portrait 17th or early 18th century? When we visited RISD 15 years ago, we looked at every piece of information they had, x-rays, uh, paint analysis, um, you know, it, it did, sh there was some evidence the paint, the painting was a little manipulated to clean it and maybe do some other things, but nothing major. Um, and, we went thinking this is likely cast of cinnamon, and they were convinced it was not. And it came down to the only evidence they had was it was in Rhode Island. And um, we don't think anybody was in the colonies um, capable. There were a couple of people who were potential candidates. A guy named Feeks, who was a good friend of John Winthrop. And he has stuff um, in the Worcester Art Museum. It's decent, you know, who knows? It, you know, Winthrop's gone back and forth to <coughs> England a few times in the 40s and 60s. You know, did he have it done there? You know, those are things we don't, don't know. Did he ever take Casa Cinema with him? Really? No, no, no evidence of that at all. Um, so, and because, um, you know, it was too good of a painting for the 18th, 17th century, it had to be 18th. The paint analysis was equivocal. It could have been 17th, it could have been 18th, but they went with Ninigrit II. And, you know, so, and that's sort of the, the story that, are, that emerged. Um, and we argued quite differently. Now, we didn't have an agenda, we just thought, you know, get it right. There's no way, there's no way Winthrop would have spent this much money on a painting to depict Ninigrid. It just doesn't, 
doesn't work at all. Next slide. Um, so here's some of those arguments, you know, and they're really just kind of ridiculous and unfounded. There's no evidence for a lot of these things. Um, one of the arguments was, you know, uh, Nineveh had a personal relationship with John Winthrop Jr. Absolutely not. There's, you know, I've looked at a, all, all the 17th century documents for London Reef Marines. There's no evidence whatsoever that they had anything other than an adversarial relationship. You know, business relations with John uh, Winthrop Jr. No evidence for that. Yeah, occasionally Nineveh would bring in a wampum payment for tribute, but um, both of those, by the way, would certainly fit Cassa Cinnamon's description. Um, Ninigrit saved Winthrop's life. Zero evidence for that. I don't know where that came from. It's just one person in one letter saying all this stuff that was accepted uncritically by the, you know, Rhode Island School of Design curators. Uh, the metal on his necklace, that big round thing, it's, it's a, it was a medal to honor Ninigrit for saving Winthrop's life. It's not metal, it's shell. I mean, it's very clearly, it's, it's shell. Um, the portent was painted in Boston in 1647 during an official visit by Ninigrit. Yeah, Ninigrit was summoned to Boston in 1647 because he was being really bad. Um, I don't think, yeah, he was there, but there's zero evidence that they painted a portrait at that time. In fact, it was just the opposite. They almost declared war on Ninigrit in that meeting. Um, and again, it was, you know, soon to be Ninigrit because it was an historical society. So, you know, my arguments is a, those are wrong. It doesn't necessarily mean it's Casa Cinnamon, but we know about the close personal relationship. We know, um, you know, political relationship. We know, you know, they were together and working together th until uh, Winthrop Jr.'s death in 1676. And, you know, it... You know, it could have been 17th or 18th. It does depict a young, ma youngish man. I don't know if that's meaningful or not. Um, if Cass Cinnamon in 1660, he would have been about 50 years old. That seems to depict a much younger man. So does that mean it was painted earlier? What <coughs> you mentioned earlier that Cass Cinnamon facilitated John Winthrop Jr.'s acquisition of Mines up in Sturbridge area, which isn't that far from Boston. No, no. Um, but um, so, I, so it would make sense that if, would, if you're going to argue between the two, that Kansas City would have more opportunity to be up in that neck of the woods than Minigrid. Oh, but there's no evidence Cass City was up there either. Um, yeah, no, he didn't do that from Boston. You know, he was just a signatory on the deed. I don't think he was like, you know, in Boston at, to, at, that, at that time. Winthrop was actually in Amiog at that time, or, or in Hartford. Um, so, you know, there's, there's no evidence either way that, you know, Cass Simmon or Ninigrit was painted. There's nothing in the historical record whatsoever. Um, were they both in Boston? We know Ninigrit was, Cass Simmon could have been. And we know that Winthrop is really close to a, a guy named Feeks, who was a painter. Um, and I think they had, I think it, he might have married Winthrop's sister. But that doesn't prove anything either. Um, so it, it's a mystery, but I think the circumstantial evidence suggests if it's in the Winthrop family, commissioned by John Winthrop, it's most likely of Cassa Cinnamon because of the, the, the relationship that they had. Um, next slide. In this one, Christine, you, are you here? There you are. Hi. Um, Christine sent me this today, and I forgot all about this. So this is a, a stained glass window in Westerly Library. The irony is, when that was installed, it was considered to be Ninigrit. Now, RISD accepts the arguments we're making that it's cast as cinnamon, but the irony is, that is his home. Casa Cinnamon grew up in Squamscut, Westerly, Weekapog area somewhere. So it fits. That's where he's from. Whether it's Ninigrit or Casa Cinnamon, you know, they both would have, you know, an association with that. 
with that landscape. So I appreciate that. That was, a, that was great. All right, thank you. I won't take up any more time, but if you have questions, I'll be glad to answer them. Yes. In Watch Hill, there's a, a statue of Nineveh called the Pitch. Pitch. Yeah. Uh, and that was commissioned by, by uh, some of the relatives of my wife. Uh, oh, really? The, that's a great. Research. That's a great statue. Are there other likenesses of Nineveh? That, that no, I mean none. Of, you can't trust any of these likenesses. I think the oil painting, whoever it is, is probably a decent likeness. I think any of those images I showed you are probably a decent likeness. They do reflect personality, but there's no other. They almost don't exist. Those are the only known images of native people um, in the 17th century that I'm aware of. In New England, anyway. Yes, in the back. Yeah, I, I wonder if you could take us back to the latter half of the 17th century in knowing. Um, I gather Cass Cinnamon and his crew, maybe a few hundred, are living in knowing. And I wonder if you could, could, to the extent possible, tell us how they're living, what they're, you know, what kind of dwellings they're in. Uh, what, are the men fishing? Are they hunting? Are there any farming going on? What are the women doing? If you could just sort of take us back there. Um, all the above. Um, I think we're probably looking at, um, you know, a few hundred people anyway. Um, several dozen dwelling houses or wigwams, um, and they're probably about 28 feet by 14 feet long. The, the, the dwellings are sort of um, Quonset hut looking, if you know, and they're you know oval. Um, 10 to 15 people would would live live in them. Uh, maybe a couple of sisters and their families. Uh, they're definitely farming. It's an important part of the subsistence economy. But so is, and it's frequently mentioned, fishing, fowling, and clamming. That was such an important part of the Pequot subsistence economy. Even, they, even when they were forced to leave Noank in 1712 or 14, um, up to Mashantucket, there's several laws explicitly, state colonial laws explicitly stating that they had the rights to move seasonally to Noank to fish, fowl, and clam. And as late as the Victorian era, there are reports of Pequot families just showing up in someone's front yard or backyard, yeah. making camp and fishing, fowling, and clamming. Um, so that was important. Um, it's also clear that um, they only had 500 acres. So Native horticulture is Swidden horticulture. It's a very extensive system that eats up a lot of land. So, you know, you can clear a plot of land and plant, but it's only productive for a couple of years because corn just strips nitrogen out of the soil. So you have to abandon it for 10, 12, 15 years and clear another piece. And that keeps going. So if you were to walk into Noank um, in, you know, 1680, you would see a mosaic of uh, fields and various stages of regrowth, um, including corn. But 500 acres will not sustain uh, a population very long, which is why in 1658, now this is only seven or eight years after the Pequots are granted Noank, they petitioned Connecticut for additional land because the soils at Noank are exhausted and there's no more firewood. Mm -hmm. So they grant them a piece of land at the head of the Mystic called War Orm Oak, um, right, in, right in Old Mystic, that those extensive flat fields to the north. Um, that's probably what, the, what, what they're talking about. And how long they used that, we're not sure, but Mash and Tucket was granted in 1666. So, you know, they're, they're moving up there. So they were always stressed for resources here because the land base was so, um, so, so small. 
Now, an English person, because they have draft animals and manure, they can extract, you know, the, the average farm might have been 50 acres. They can extract a lot of, of calories and resources out of that 50 acres because of the draft animals and et cetera, et cetera. Not so much the Pequots, who did not really ad adopt any aspects of English farming until the you know, mid-1700s. But there's a really interesting event that happened. So because the English proprietors here, and you've seen the plat map of Noank, right, the divisions, um, that's, a, that's pretty busy. There's a lot, of your, a lot of English here, and it's a growing population. Their children are needing more land. So the Pequots are getting increasingly, you know, squeezed out. So much so that in 1712, um, the Connecticut uh, government basically says, okay, you're, you, you've got to move. You, you can't be here anymore. Um, you can maintain your fishing, fowling, and clamming rights, but not planting rights. So English are moving in. They're beginning to build permanent fencing, stone walls. And this is what's interesting. Um, at that, I think about 1713, one of the, sa the sachem that succeeded um, Cassius Cinnamon was, uh, was, was Scadab. He's called Scadab. Um, and he was a, a, a real vehement advocate for Pequot land rights. Um, you know, he had a different... Um, approach than Cassius Cinnamon did. And that approach is reflected in the fact that he was arrested. We know about him because of a court case. He was arrested in 1713 and he was petitioning to get his blacksmith tools back. And the reason he was arrested he and his, the rest of the Pequots who were in Noank, they not only tore down a stone wall, they pulverized it. <laughs> pulverized it. I mean, they took whatever heavy they had and they beat it to dust. Now, that's a statement. Um, and I thought that was very interesting. And th that's the one aspect of, you know, uh, the, the natives constantly had to deal with in the colonial world is a constantly shrinking land base. And it's not just ownership as, you know, we think land is important. For native people, there are spiritual, emotional, ritual, ceremonial ties to the land in ways that we could never, ever appreciate. Um, so land is important for a lot of different reasons, not just for growing, you know, for growing corn. Uh, yes? So, I'm, years ago I was doing research at the Historical Society to collect information for a play, and I saw Robin Cassis Cinnamon's name associated with, I thought it was pronounced Skadabi, but it's Skoda. Right? Uh, I mean, who knows? I, yeah. Wafa and Aqua. Do those names ring a bell? Not offhand, but... Because okay. um, somewhere I've read that this contingent went to the general court in Hartford. Oh, uh, somebody probably had their... They probably signed their names on the document. I mean, if, if I went through the documents, I'd recognize them. And, and protested the taking of the land. And they were then given the right to clam fish and um, that could be, there That was a constant issue, and the, and the courts actually many times re, you know, reaffirm that right. And that's an aboriginal uh, right that's, it, they all, everyone, Native people, Narragansetts claim it, uh, Wampanoag, abor, ab, aboriginal right to fishing, fowling, and cooking. Yeah. <laughs> Am I understanding correct that the Pequots were summer down Away, fishing, clearing, etc. And then they wintered over up in the Ledger area. And they moved up and down along the South Flanders Road. Probably. I mean, 
if they're at Mashantucket, which is their permanent home, and we've excavated those communities, and they're there year round. But as you suggested, and as the laws suggest, they move seasonally to the coast for fishing, fowling, and clamming. Now, before the Pequot War, their villages would have been on the coast, and they wouldn't have had to move to the coast. They would have moved inland for gathering stuff or hunting. So it was a bit of a reversal. Um, I don't know. Yeah. You had a question in back? Yeah, with the uh, burial ground by BB Cove? Yeah. Uh, do, you know, do we know where that is? Um, I could probably, f it's where the intersection of... Um, Fishtown. 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 Where the hidden lake is. It could be. Eva Butler, uh, it was, they were putting, they were um, making the state they road, which is what, 215. And during that construction, they impacted that cemetery. And, you know, I looked at Eva Butler's notes. I looked at a couple of the artifacts. It's clearly 17th century, which suggests it's probably associated with the Noank community. And that's about all, all we know. Didn't Packer have ongoing disputes with B plots about property lines in Noank and recording by settlement? He did. He also had disputes with them up at Mashantucket as well. And there's some, I can't remember the details, but there's some interesting land swaps going on. And uh, but yeah, you're essentially correct, but the details uh, escape me. Yeah. In, in the history of West Fist, if there is a reference to an Indian burial ground across the street from the Packer house on no, Yes. Yep. Yeah, there is. That's the one <laughs> And I've looked at the artifacts. Some of those survive in the, um, the collections of the state archaeologists, and they're, seven, they're 17th century, too. They fit. Wasn't the Packer House about where the Westminster Post Office is now? That I don't know. Um, <clears throat> two, two sort of questions. Uh, you've done a number of digs in the area, including very extensive up at the Fort and Mystic. Uh, are there any thoughts or plans of doing more digs? No, perhaps. Um, no, not at the moment. But thing right now, we're focused on this small village site that Mason burned during the Pequot War in Pequot Woods. Um, but you know, we we still continue to do work on the Pequot War. One interesting thing that we have discovered in our work is. Um, the battles that took place here were far more, far more complex. We're finding evidence of battles that are taking place in Bluff Point, um, near Fort Hill, uh, Haley Farm. And I think what we're seeing is probably after the Mystic Fort attack, and within a week or so, the Pequots supposedly begin to leave their homeland. But we also know that the English were coming back looking for refugee or remnant communities of Pequots in Pequot territory. And I think there apparently were a lot more than we think. I think we were all wrong about the fact they just left. Mm -hmm. They're here. And the signature is, you know, these clusters of musket balls and brass arrow points in certain areas indicating fighting. Um, so I have no doubt that we would probably see some of this in the Noank area. Um, and it may well be that we'll be, you know, we'll, we'll get down here at, at some point uh, to look into that. Well, yes. Second. Oh, question yeah, was, too. That's right. could you define the distinction of the Pequot name and the Matchetucket, how they, they keep getting interchanged, but there's obviously uh, uh, much different foundation. So the, the Matchetucket moniker is meant to distinguish the Western Pequot from the Eastern Pequot, who are called the Pawcatuck Pequot. So after the Pequot War, two main groups of Pequots emerged following the Treaty of Hartford. One was the Eastern or Pawcatuck Pequots, who now have a reservation in North Stonington. The other was the, the Pequot who began as 
Namiog, then Noank, and then Mash and Tucket. So Mash, those are place names. So Mash and Tucket is the name of the place where the Mash and Tucket Reservation is today. If, if I could suggest, there is an, a wonderful exhibit now at the Florence Griswold uh, Museum where there is indigenous art and all the their labels that explain each each Pequot section. And I I recently got to hear Scott um, Scott's Maddie Stevens from Syracuse University. He's a Mohawk. Who, spoke about Thomas Cole, who was a, a, a painter of indigenous people. And the interesting thing I learned was every painting has just a single Indian. They're never depicted in groups. Yeah, that's true. I never thought of it like that, but you're right. And that was to um, sort of symbolize the fact that they were disappearing. Interesting. Anybody else have? Yes. Can you tell us a little bit more about the Mason's Island burial ground? That was my backyard. <laughs> um, yeah. So as you, you know, as you probably know, um, we don't know where native cemeteries are because they're not marked. They may have been marked at some time in some way, but and they're usually found during construction projects. So um, there was a, a very nice couple who were building their dream house. Um, and during the course of construction, they noticed human remains um, coming out. So they did the right thing. You know, they called the state police. Then the state police determined it wasn't a major crime. They called in the state archaeologist who contacted the Pequots. Um, and then at that point, it was they would, des would decide what to do. But the, the way the law, the burial law in Connecticut, only gives them legally two weeks. And this is, this took us two years. Um, so, I mean, the poor landowners, they did the right thing, and they're like, you know, and the Pequots said, we're going to take care of you. And they did. I mean, they, but uh, they reimbursed him for all site costs, bought him a better lot across the street on the water. They, you know, they, did, you know, and they, and they gave them, I think, a hundred thousand dollars just for pain and suffering. They couldn't afford to do that today, sure. But the cemetery is very interesting because it was somewhat. It was the first generation after the Pequot War, so it's 1650s to 1670 or so. Um, the artifacts, you know, fit that. Many of the individuals were, as you can imagine what happens during a construction project, the bones are scattered all over the place. Um, we spent two years recovering everything from back dirt piles, basically sifting through eighth inch screen to recover. Um, then we took all the human remains and we brought in a forensic anthropologist who spent two more years trying to associate, you know, uh, and the goal was, you know, help us understand the Pequots who were there. Um, and it was kind of interesting. It, it was a little unexpected. We, uh, we saw a normal, demogra a normal mortality curve, which converts to a normal demographic cur curve. You know, you know, a healthy population of children, sub-adults, men and women. The ratio, remember that ratio I mentioned before, one to eight or nine following the Pequot War? This was normal. So a generation after the war, there was recovery. They were relatively healthy, no sign of disease, tuberculosis. Um, so it seemed to be a relatively healthy population. And, you know, of course, Native people bury uh, there are people with funerary objects of various kinds that reflect certain aspects of role, status, spirituality. Those were interesting. They tended to be early, a lot of Dutch material, which kind of made sense. Um, so the Pequots purchased that land. We put everything back. Um, and there are probably an untold number of graves that are still there that we did not touch that are, you know, are to be preserved. Um, 
So and that's, that's where it lies now. So whenever anyone on Mason's Island, Rufus, you know, is, um, he, 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 he will call and he'll consult. Like, I'm doing this, this, you know, any danger. Plus, the town of Stonington has been really good, too, requiring archaeological surveys and sensitive areas like Mason's Island. Um, I'm getting off track, but when we are doing our work there for Rufus on a small project, we uncovered a lot of musket balls, probably from the War of 1812, mm -hmm. where we know that there was a, an attempt by the British to raid up to Mystic, and were beaten back by the local militia. And that's probably what we're what we're seeing, because we're seeing the uh, British caliber bullets and things like that. But, uh, yeah, just. You might be interested in uh, Rufus and Lou Allen's father, James Allen, for a good book on Mason's Island called Major Mason's Great Island. And he does mention the cemetery. Yeah, it's a good, good book. It's, it's very useful. Two citations. Well, thank you. Appreciate it.